As many? Chair recognize the Honorable Member for Fox Hill. Uh, first, um, I want to begin, if I may, uh, with a few words of condolences to the family uh, of the Moscows uh, on the death of uh, George Moscow, who is the, or was the leader and senior Moscow, as I knew it in the country. Uh, Mr. Moscow was an important businessman, uh, artisan, and tradesman, and uh, as an emigre to this country uh, in a time when uh, the Greek community began to establish its presence here in the Bahamas, uh, went on to make a significant contribution to the building up of the Bahamas. Uh, in a personal uh, sense, uh, I had a great deal of affection for him because of his relationship with my late parents. And uh, my mother and father tell a discussion point when we met each other, uh, even in the latter years. Uh, and so I want to um, express on their behalf, since obviously they're not able to do so, but on behalf of my family. Uh, condolences uh, on the passing of this uh, Bahamian uh, businessman. I was able to express at lunchtime to his uh, son directly uh, the condolences of my family uh, on his passing. Uh, secondly, sir, if I may be permitted to remind uh, members of Parliament again about this uh, birthday tribute for Ambassador Sidney Poitier, which takes place on Sunday at 7 p.m. All members of Parliament and their spouses. Uh, unfortunately, um, the ambassador is unable to come, but the tribute is being broadcast live to his home in Los Angeles. And I hope that there is a good turnout. Uh, 90 years is quite uh, an accomplishment for a Bahamian of this stature, who I, I would gather is perhaps the most famous Bahamian, alive, certainly, uh, knighted by the Queen uh, from the Bahamas in 1974, and having won an Academy Award as the first black male to do so uh, in 1963. And uh, those of us who remember also in 1967, he was the highest paid actor in the world. And this is a man who has never forgotten his roots in the Bahamas, and in particular in Cat Island. And so I hope uh, people are able to uh, find time uh, on Sunday to attend this uh, special event, which will be recorded live to tape and uh, will be broadcast on the uh, on ZNS uh, on the 20th of February, which is his actual 19th birthday. So I just wanted to say those two things at the start. Mr. So Speaker, I would venture that if you went to Betsy Bay, Mayaguano, or McLeanstown, Grand Bahama, or Matthewtown, Inagua, or Treasure Key, Abaco, and like the member of parliament for Golden Gates, when he spoke last week, do a survey of the matters that are important to Bahamian voters, I would guess that not one of them would mention the Freedom of Information Act as amongst their priorities. Uh, there's an expression that uh, the, the late Rex Nettleford used to use uh, to, to describe um, a certain social class. And he said that he would, he would often describe women of a particular certain, uh, a so certain social class as ladies of quality. And this is one of these issues which is sexy for that class, the ladies of quality who can take time from their busy schedules, join the We March, 
and then after the march is over, say, I've made my contribution to my country, and now I can go home and soak my feet in the salt water uh, because I've made my contribution. Uh, don't dare and call them out twice because the second time around, they're a little too busy. Uh, it's, it's one of these issues, Mr. Speaker, that um, my friend Calvin Brown said he always found remarkable about this country. Um, you go to an F&M rally in the Bahamas and everybody's pulling up in their Mercedes Benzes and BMWs and fine suits and they get up on the platform and say, what a terrible country it is. You go to the PLP rallies, people catching bus, dragging slippers, and they get and they get they get on get that's right, and they get on the platform and say, What a great country the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is. S sometimes, Mr. Speaker, and I, I say this in a joking fashion, you 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 have to you have to examine the rhetoric because you won't believe you won't believe yourself <laughs> if you pay attention to the headlines and the propaganda about the public policy in which you, as a member of the Progressive Liberal Party government, in which we are involved. You really have to, as the Bible says, be clothed in your right mind every morning when you set out. Otherwise, you think you're li living in fiction land. And one of the things that folk are expert at doing is somehow the side opposite has been able to portray that all that is good in the world, all that is moral in the world, reposes on that side. But we, who were raised in the same country, had the same teachers, go to the same churches, suddenly all that is evil is reposed on this side. How, how, how is that? How, how is that? That is counterintuitive. It can't work. It can't work. And all of the allegations that have been made about corruption and who is corrupt and who is not corrupt, what we know is that the only example we have of corruption that is a proven case is a case connected with the Free National Movement. That's right. That's right. With the Free National Movement. Convicted in court. Convicted in court. Convicted in court. Convicted in court. That's what we know. I said, I said, I said, I said, no, 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 no. I am going there. I am going there. I'm going there. Members? I'm going there because I just want to repeat what I'm saying. I'm saying, I'm saying this group, this group, this group is not selective memory. This group makes an allegation against the PLP as being corrupt. The PLP as being corrupt. And I'm saying that in this term, in this term, the only allegation that we have that is proven that is the, of corruption is connected with the free national movement. That's what I said. Yeah. Well, I'm saying it now. I'm saying it now. And that's the point. Because the allegation is made by this group. Against this group. We're talking about our time. No. We're talking about our time. And so I'm saying, you know, I agree with you. The same way the leader of the opposition from a seat is to say, don't go there, I implore you, don't go there. Don't go there. Mr. Speaker, there is a, an argument uh, that was put by one of, the, in one of the interventions this morning saying that this bill does nothing to provide for, and I'm paraphrasing here, cabinet deliberations to become public. 
Now, why would you want cabinet deliberations to become public? Why would you want that? Right now, under the Public Records Act, which I believe another speaker from the other side disagreed, says that this legislation sticks with what is in the Public Records Act, that the records cannot be revealed until 30 years have passed. And that's the record we are keeping. The member said when he spoke that he thought that it should be 15 years, because that's the modern uh, practice. But I believe that 30 years was chosen because, generally speaking, that's a generation. And the idea is that by the time the time expires, all of the people who have been actively involved in the decision making have largely passed from the scene, either naturally gone or have retired uh, off the scene. I recall in this connection uh, when people ask Arthur Hanna why he wouldn't write his memoirs or write a, hi a history book. And he says, I can't because there are too many people al alive now and if I write the truth, I'll be in problems. No, he has nothing to hide. But what he's saying is that you, the problem is, can you speak frankly about a situation when people are still around? Because it causes offense. So you leave it. Now, so the rule, I believe, came that you don't want a situation where people have been sitting around in a cabinet freely exchanging their views about how policy devolves and how po policy should evolve and to find those deliberations in a public forum. And there is a difference between privacy and public life. There is a difference. There's a reason for privacy. And there's a reason you want to keep control over certain confidential uh, recommendations which people make. Cabinet deliberations are meant so that people can have a free exchange of views behind closed doors. And under the present rules, 30 years must elapse before those deliberations can become public. We were fascinated, for example, when Sir Clifford Darling wrote his book uh, about the labor movement. And when the book came about, the British had just, the 30-year period, had just expired on many of the confidential cables which had been sent from the British governor to the British government in England. And it was fascinating for us to see what they thought about all of the individuals uh, they were dealing with in the Bahamian government and in the opposition at the time. Some of them were not very flattering. Not very flattering at all. But can you imagine, here's a governor, here's a governor trying to sort out a situation, a problem, and he's making, he's making a, a confidential, uh, giving confidential advice, confidential advice to his superiors in London, and then he finds that confidential advice in the public domain. Undermi precisely, undermines, undermines the capacity for government to continue. So that's one of the reasons. It may, may not be correct, may not be right, but that's the reason why the 30-year rule is important and chosen, and the principle, I think, is sound. Another... Sorry. Wouldn't, for, for I wouldn't Trump? interrupt the member if it weren't for the fact that his argument has already proven to be incongruent. He just said a little while ago that the only member of a political party found to be guilty of corruption in our time is a member of the free national movement. Now, he admitted later, after being uh, told from members opposite seats, that there are examples of PLPs in prior times who were brought before the courts uh, and found guilty of corrupt acts. However, the same case he references in relation to a member under a prior FNM administration, it is known that the courts were informed as to acts uh, taken by the cabinet during that same period of time that were uh, accepted as information during the court matter involving that same person. So if he is saying that that was in fact a uh, benefit to our democracy, 
knowing the actions taken by that prior BEC board and what transpired within the cabinet at that time to the limited extent that we are aware. If he's saying that that was good for democracy, he must therefore admit that having knowledge of what transpired in the cabinet then implies that it is still good today to know what transpires in certain cases in cabinets now and into the future. Thank you, Honorable Member. Now, if I were Member in for the Foxall. Oxford Debating Society, you know, I, I would accept everything you say. Unfortunately, we're talking about the real world now mm -hmm. in right. the Commonwealth of the Bahamas in 2017. Mm -hmm. The point is this. In criminal matters, if a court requires information, there is a mechanism for a court to get after that information. We are not talking now about criminal information. My argument relates to the civil polity in which we are engaged and the question of how policy is developed. When policy is developed, the argument is that it should be developed in an atmosphere where people can give a free exchange of views, knowing that those views will not become public until after a certain time. That's the issue that I'm arguing. Now, obviously, criminality cannot be beyond the reach of the court, nor can it be beyond the reach of investigators. And you cannot, you can go to, you can go into a court and uh, you can make an assertion as the Crown that you have what the Americans call executive privilege or public interest privilege or Crown privilege in our jurisdiction. But a court accepts the certificate but is able to go behind the certificate to find out whether or not the, the assertion of the Crown is correct and whether the information is probative. And if it is more probative than prejudicial, then often the court will allow it. But even then in limited circumstances, because you don't want to erode the principle that cabinet ministers discuss policy matters in an atmosphere of confidentiality. And the 30-year rule is designed to protect that. And this act, um, this act it aligns itself with the current Public Records Act, which says that uh, 30 years is the mark. Um, Mr. Speaker, there is also the experience where policy which is revealed in the public domain while that policy is inchoate may in fact damage the larger interests of our country. So in other words, if policy is being developed and people are still trying to design the policy, it is not in the public interest, in my view, for that policy to be in its halfway form exposed to public debate because it undermines the larger public policy. And so therefore, those who say, oh, let's open up everything, let's let everybody see, in my view, this will, will retard the forward progress of a country. Now, obviously, the uh, atmosphere today has changed significantly from when our predecessors in office one generation ago ran the country. And I, I came into this argument when we were seeking to decide whether this country should sign on to the single market and economy. And I recall that when Prime Minister Pinley went to Grenada at Grand Anse in 1989, he went down there, signed the agreement, made a commitment to the country to become integrated in CARICOM, and then came back, in my words, came back to the Bahamas and said, fellas, I got a good deal for you. And that's the way governance ran. In fact, if sometimes you ask the question to the public and it causes such alarm, the question itself, that if you didn't ask them at all and simply act, some people say members of parliament and the government, they're delegates, and so they're elected to carry out policy on behalf of the country, and you simply act, then you'll find that in the end, the public policy, in fact, works out better for the country instead of a row ensuing over policy which is inchoate. 
So I believe that as well. And again, it argues for balance in everything that we do uh, and in public policy. Mr. Speaker, I wish to speak to some extent about the heads of agreement that have become the subject of some uh, fodder during the course of this debate. In mentioning the heads of agreement, the question arose of what is the position with regard to immigration uh, in these heads of agreement. Uh, in speaking to the press, in discussing matters with my colleagues, I have often wondered why in all of these agreements there is a necessity to put the numbers that these uh, investors want to put for immigration permits. I've always questioned that. Notwithstanding that, that is the agreed position that many investors want. They want to know that if there is a skills shortage in the country, that those skills can be supplemented by their applying and getting uh, work permits in order for those workers to come in. This is not a new problem. If you go back to the construction of the British colonial back in 1922, artisans and laborers had to be brought in because they said the skills were not available here. And the question always arises, how do you keep the training uh, up to speed for the younger people so that they can take the jobs which become available when these uh, windfalls occur? Here is a position I would like to say to this country with regard to immigration. Notwithstanding the numbers that are put in these heads of agreement, the test and the principle remains the same. The only way that Bahamians are, the only way that work permits are issued is if Bahamians are not available for those jobs. It has to run the test of the Department of Labor. So even though a heads of agreement says 500 work permits, you can't simply come to the Department of Immigration and say, give me my 500 work permits. You have to show first, job is available. Secondly, there's a requirement. It meets the requirements of the law that there's no, um, there, there are no artisans available or anyone to fill the space. And in those situations, the work permit is granted. And that's, that's why I was saying, in effect, the numbers are... Uh, uh, redundant because let us say they need more than 500 if they're 500 indeed that they ask for it may be that they need 600 does it mean by the agreement that they're only limited to 500 we want them to finish the project when you look on balance you may say that the the shortcut which it allows to finish the pro, pro, um, project creates more economic opportunity for Bahamians, and so therefore, on balance, you might have to do that. All of those considerations come into play. And tourism, as you know, is, is, is such a magic bullet for the Caribbean. It's the fastest, the quickest way to get people to work, can do it in a short space of time, People with no skills can basically be trained in about six months and up and running for thousands of workers. And we led the Caribbean in this. And so that's the principle that I want to establish that remains with immigration. That this is something which we monitor. Uh, we're not just ciphers where people pass paper through. We try to do a job on behalf of the Bahamian people based on that principle that jobs should first be reserved for Bahamians. And I've got to tell you that the Department of Immigration, with its 300 employees, is overwhelmed by the extent to which Bahamians demand the review of all of these projects by the Department of Immigration. And we lean heavily on the Department of Labor. We've got now four or five different investigations going at various touristic and other projects in the Bahamas where Bahamian employees have been complaining about abuse by um, uh, uh, managers who have work permits 
and are abusing Bahamians in these various jobs and denying them opportunities. The Department of Immigration is not equipped to study this as an issue or investigate this as an issue. And the Department of Labor has the power to do so. And so anytime some complaint is made to us, <coughs> investigations are then begun. And I want to thank the Director of Labor for the work which he and his staff do, and they do it quite quickly, and they're quite expert at it, in seeking to find out what the real issues are. And yes, there is some, uh, oftentimes there's a problem because Bahamians want to use this blunt instrument when there is a personal issue between people. But the Department of Labor is quite expert at ferreting out what is correct and what is incorrect. So I wanted to make that point as well that we are working to try and protect jobs for Bahamians in that way, but we are overwhelmed uh, by the numbers. And, uh, and we work as expeditiously uh, as we can, because we understand that the benefits of this economy must be protected uh, for uh, Bahamians. So speaker, as an adjunct to that, I want to also decry the propensity to preach doom and gloom. This morning, there was a, I believe it was this morning, there was a headline in this morning's newspaper about cruise ships shifting their berths from Nassau to Cuba. I'm sorry? <coughs> yes, drops Nassau in favor of Cuba. Now, Immediately, in these various groups that now control the way you get information on, uh, in social media and on your phone, the doom and gloom merchants started. Uh, we told you so. Oh, Cuba's coming. And this and that and so on and so forth. As if they're happy that it's actually happening. And you know, um, the... the, the, the Member Parliament for Kalani, the leader of the Free National Movement, was busy predicting who he's going to send to jail uh, when he takes over, and, um, and predicting that in six or seven weeks, um, presumably he's going to be running the country. Well, you know, two can play at predictions. Uh, as George Mackey used to say, not only one woman born a crazy child. And if one person could play crazy, the next one could play crazy too. And so I want to say, there is going to be a contest. There's going to be a contest. There are going to be free and fair elections in this country. <laughs> there will be free and fair elections in this country. <laughs> free and fair elections. And soon enough, we will know the result. But what we know is that in the now going on five years that we've been in office, we have done significant heavy lifting. And we've done this heavy lifting in the face of unremitting hostility from those people who tell the story, or who are supposed to be telling, the true, honest, and balanced story of what we're doing. I mean, the ambush that the member of parliament for Golden Eyes, Isles endured. I'd never heard such foolishness about where the VAT money has gone. I mean, it's foolishness. The, the fact is, the fact is, the money goes into the consolidated fund, and people say, oh, we shouldn't use that word because you know, people don't know what the consolidated fund is. But if you really want to know, 70%, the consolidated fund is the big pool into which all tax monies, the Constitution says all tax monies collected have to go 
to the consolidated fund. And out of the consolidated fund, the bills of the government are paid. 70% of the bills of the government are salaries, called personal emoluments, fancy word. Amongst those salaries was the salary of the member for Kalani. That's where the VAT money went, to help pay his salary yes. as a member of parliament. If he doesn't know where it went, that's a bit. It also went to pay yours. That's right. right. It went to give the 100000 for your constituents, for each and one of us in here. It went to pay, it went to pay the, national, the national debt, which is, is national debt now the biggest chunk? The biggest chunk is national debt. Get him his car and his assistance. I mean, where it went. And, and the thing is, we're, we're so expert at this stuff. You know, I, I was telling the uh, uh, colleagues who have to do, deal with all the slogans coming up, you know, that we got to find, you know, where the wat, fat money going. Wat. Yeah, wat. Yeah, the wat. Yeah. So I'm saying it's all there <laughs> and nothing is hidden. Yeah, I well, uh, you you might have. I don't know. You might have been. You might have. No, I, I can't sing, so it wasn't me. You know. So, Mr. Speaker, Freedom of Information Act. I I I I, I end where I began. I would guess that when I'm canvassing in Fox, Hill, well, I have as I canvass in Fox Hill, I don't believe one person has asked me about this Freedom of Information Act. But, you know, the ladies of quality want it, so what the ladies of quality want, they get. Thank you, sir.